everybody. Um, as you probably know from uh, <coughs> from our previous uh, discussions and also from uh, this uh, email notification that today today's guest uh, we have is uh, Andreas Fogarashi or Andreas Fogarashi. The, the difference is uh, <coughs> because uh, well he's a Hungarian born in uh, Vienna or Viennese. Uh, Maybe, maybe he will make us more clear what he thinks about this issue. Uh, and uh, uh, he actually uh, graduated uh, uh, in Vienna. Uh, and uh, <coughs> as far as I know, he came into uh, kind of a stronger contact with the Hungarian scene uh, three years ago. Well, I would say 10 years ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you kind of became uh, more visible like two years ago when um, uh, he was uh, the artist uh, uh, chosen to represent Hungary uh, at the Venice Biennial, and uh, where he completed an amazing project which actually got uh, the uh, big prize of, of uh, the Venice Biennial. And uh, today uh, he will speak about some of his former and maybe some of his recent projects, and uh, he will kind of give an introduction also to his following two exhibitions which he, uh, he's going to have uh, in Budapest in the next uh, couple of months maybe, one at the end of the month and the other one maybe at the end of the month, exactly. Uh, yeah, the first one opens next week, oh. on Friday at Trafo. That's, okay, I didn't know that the Trafo is... Uh, 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 and the second one is at Ligat Galeria three weeks later. Yes, we have also... Uh, the director of the Ligat Galeria here, which we are whom we are welcome. So please. Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, I I will mainly talk about my most recent project that has a lot to do with with Budapest and that will be shown in Krakow from next week on. But before that, I will <coughs> talk a little bit about how I deal with information in my work and how information uh, turns into an exhibition and how I think about the didactic and the display. So um, I chose a few works that, that kind of show how I got to, to how I deal with, with material and how the projects develop. Um, I've the first things I did in the art field were magazine projects. So at the, at the time before anybody would invite me to exhibitions, I, I was involved in, in a couple of different magazine projects, always with, together with groups of people. Uh, so this, for example, was a magazine we did in 1997 in, in Vienna called Test. Uh, we only did the first, or actually this issue number zero. But it was also about just creating an audience and a public for your work. Uh, for the magazine, I, I, did a, I did interviews with museum guards, uh, asking them about their museum guards who, who guard contemporary art and who often have a troubled relationship to the things that they are watching because they don't understand it and usually they're not trained. And actually, the cover image shows me with a guard at Budapest Galeria in Leutruth, so watching something that fell off the wall. Uh, and then when I, um, and at that time I, I was still studying architecture, I studied architecture for five years, uh, and developed my artistic work parallel to that, and at a certain point I, I stopped studying architecture and started studying art, and at that time I I edited another magazine for the student body of the academy, so issued by the students and kind of dealing with uh, university politics, but also with, with just art and, uh, and theory and discourse. And the first issue that I did, and I redesigned and I, I kind of reinvented, uh, the first issue came out in, in 2000 when there was a new right-wing government in, in Austria which caused a huge stir and we were totally frightened and like 
demonstrating every every day and then every week for many months. And actually, the art scene in Vienna was was one of the focus points of of the um, of the protest against the government. And there were many initiatives, and there was a There were many actionist groups uh, in the academy, and they um, they occupied they occupied the order of the academy for a couple of weeks. And so, in, in the first issue of this magazine, I, I I collected statements by all these diverse political artistic groups. And one thing that kind of now, 12 years later, that, that remains as something important for the scene in Vienna concerning the, the shock of the, of the new right-wing government um, was that many new groups formed and new magazines and new like, people got together and, and, uh, and talked about what they could do and how a civil society could react to something like this. So, uh, many of the more interesting projects and, and magazines and groups and art spaces were founded around this time in 2003. These are a couple of more issues. And then also in 2000, but uh, without me, another magazine was founded called Deriv, a magazine for urban studies. Uh, and Deriv is a, is a notion from the French avant-garde group, the Situationists. Uh, it means drifting around in the city, aimlessly looking at where the city leads you to. Uh, and this is a magazine that comes out since 2000, quarterly in Vienna, and I've been involved from the third or fourth issue on. Uh, and it deals with the city and society, meaning that the city is like the place or the context where you can watch what's happening in society in its most condensed and dense form. So we did this. This was one of the first issues was about gentrification and about urban uh, gardening. When this was published? From 2000. Mm -hmm. This is an issue that <coughs> in 2001 about the role of culture in urban development and urban planning. Like all these big museum projects, but also these creative quarters where galleries and bars and fashion shops and all that changed the, the structure of the society within the city. This is another issue I did a few years later about branding, so about how, how cities and regions and countries uh, understand themselves more and more as, as corporate uh, entities that compete with other countries and other cities for investors and tourists and like that. So kind of watching, looking at how the corporate takes over the idea of, of, the, of the public of the public realm. So these these magazines were uh, published by yourself or working in the the one before was published by, by the student body. Mm -hmm. um, and this is published by a group of people between five and maybe twenty people and, and I'm involved from time to time more, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, it's a group of architects and sociologists and political scientists and urban planners and philosophers. And, yeah, we get we get funding from, from different from the city of Vienna and from the cultural ministry and, and we sell it throughout the German speaking world. And it has become one of the one of the leading magazines that are between disciplines and looking at the city. And it's not an academic magazine; it's a, it's, a, it's a normal people can buy it and read it. Um, and also, art plays, plays an important role. But it's not an art magazine. Mm. Now I show a few. This was my very first exhibition uh, in a gallery in Belgium in 1999. Um, and it was about, I'm not sure if I should talk about what it was about, because I wanted to talk more about display and showing things. So um, 
I could say that it consisted of, of uh, retro, retro images that I took from magazines, from art magazines and catalogues about a certain trend in contemporary art that was very strong in the 90s um, that we could call ambient art or relational aesthetics. Uh, so it was a lot about uh, atmospheres and interior spaces and a certain idea of communication. So what I did was kind of to recreate spatially these, these atmospheres. And one thing was to have these photographs on the wall. And they are mounted on the wall by, by having a, a, a large roll of, of um, double-sided sticky film on the wall and just putting the photos on the wall. So the area surrounding the photos will also be sticky. So theoretically, you could add more things or just dust gutters on the, on the on the wall. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I was always very interested in, in how things are presented to us, how images are presented to us. So this is another work that uses kind of, um, standard display methods. These are foam boards, you know, this thing with cardboard and foam in the middle, that I knew very well from, from architecture presentations, but also photographs are very often mounted on it. So I took the standard format of these, of these sheets that are 70 by 100 centimeters and just laid them against the wall and used them to, to collect material about a certain topic. And think of them as kind of uh, archival cards. When I first showed the work, they were not laid out like that, but, but you could browse through them. But it proved that nobody would do that. Nobody would touch the work, so I, I, I laid it out instead. Uh, it's about the build the headquarters of the Communist Party in France, in Paris, built by the architect Oscar Niemeyer, uh, and it's a very beautiful building, the 1960s design, but because of um, what happened in 1968 in Paris, the Communist Party got in a very difficult position, and the building was only completed 15 years later in the 80s, when this kind of uh, 1960s UFO style was already totally out of fashion. And when I did the work in 2001, this aesthetics got fashionable again. You know, these 60s were very, very hot. And, and for example, what we see here on the right side is a photo shoot in Vogue that was shot in the headquarters of the Communist Party. <coughs> And on the third board, we see just a lot of photos that I took when I visited the building, more or less as a tourist, as kind of tourist snapshots. Uh, there's a newspaper article that I found about the problem. The Communist Party in France was very, very important in the 50s, in the 60s. It was one of the biggest communist parties in Europe, in the part of Europe that was not ruled by communist parties. Uh, but not anymore, now it, it's you know, totally marginal. And this newspaper article about, is about how the party tries to become attractive again to young people. And one of the things they do is to do a rave party in their headquarters, mm -hmm. which, is, you know, which is something that could be cool and, and attract young people. And then on one of the boards, there is this short text uh, cut out by Lisa, and it says, anti-racism must become fashionable. And this is one of the slogans that came up during these 2000 protests in Austria. And it's a very interesting slogan because on the one hand, it, you know, everybody would agree that anti-racism and fighting against you know, right-wing government is something that should be you know, something attractive to anyone. But if you call it fashionable, just as the architecture and as anything that's fashionable, and as Victor Vasarelli, as we will see later, as soon as it's fashionable, it will go out of fashion again. So it's, I was interested in the notion of fashion and how, how aesthetics can be linked to, to politics. You know, what, what, how would the headquarters of the Communist Party look? What is communist architecture? That's also something that here in Hungary, everything that is from the 50s, 60s, and 70s is considered as communist art architecture. <coughs> Although it looks the same as architecture in the US built at the same time. The 
because it's modernist universalist architecture. Of course, there are things that are, and that are the things that I'm interested in, you know, what, what could link in aesthetics to politics. That's another work, again, employing different display methods that I, that I researched and that I was interested in. Um, again, using these boards, but this time they are not foam boards, but uh, aluti bond, which is a material actually used for building facades because it's very light and strong, but but everybody who does art knows it as the material that you mount photos on. And this is about Innsbruck, about the visual representations of Innsbruck, which is the capital of Tyrol, the region of Austria. So, for example, it shows the logos of Innsbruck, Tyrol and Austria, again looking at this kind of branding of the place and, and how the place becomes the, the tourism brand, but also when it's a tourism brand, it's also, it also involves uh, the people living there, so it's a kind of zooming into into the city. Then this is a built-in video screen that shows um, the TV commercial for Andorra, which is a small country in the Pyrenees that not many people really know about, except that it's a small country in the Pyrenees. And not surprisingly, it has the same imagery as Tyrol. So you have the mountains, and you have a city, and you have two little children the landscape. And opposite of these boards you have this kind of um, construction that is a little bit like a, like a panorama, like because in Innsbruck there's a there's a panorama painting, just like the festive panorama that was, uh, of the battle at Bergisel and Bergisel is a is a mountain next to Innsbruck where now they have an Olympic ski jumping ramp designed by Zaha Hadid. So this construction takes up this kind of stretching of the panorama painting, but also the kind of the curve of the Zaharit building. But it has no image, it's empty. It just only has this kind of lines running up and down, and one is a steel cable, and one is a, a climbing rope. So it's, it's kind of a, of a dysfunctional uh, trade fair architecture or shop design. I was invited to do a work um, for the office of a big car importer in Austria. So for the foyer and the office and the budget was quite nice because they expected something, you know, some fancy production. And I used most of the money for some travels, for some research travels, to places of the car industry. I went to the to the um, Mondial de l'Automobile, which is a big uh, car fair in taking a place every year in Paris, and I, I went there as a research trip into, into display techniques and into how, how the cars are presented to us and how images of cars are presented to us. And I did two other travels, one to Wolfsburg, where the Volkswagen is built, which is a city built only for the purpose of housing the people working in the Volkswagen plant, <coughs> and another travel to Toliati in Russia where the Lada is built. So it's again, just like Wolfsburg was built in 1938, uh, and Toliati was built in 68, just 30 years later. But it's a monocultural city. They have the big Lada plant and, and a very big modern city built around it. And then I built these kind of display structures for showing these photographs that I took in these places. So there's this kind of wall land against the wall, and then there's this kind of uh, it's like a sign, but it's also like a, like a pedestal. It's like these advertising pylons that stand in front of gas stations where you see the price of gas. And they're just kind of models, mock-ups mock built in, in plywood. Cheap, but not, not trashy. They are beautiful, but, but it's a bit strange because you expect it from a different material. And then there was a, another piece, which was a kind of wall display again with photos from, from the cities. On the right, this is the, the cultural palace in, in Wolfsburg, and then next to it is the cultural palace in Toliati. So I was looking at the places of culture in these in this industrial cities. And actually, this, this piece standing here in front was my first object that didn't carry any information other than its form and materiality. Uh, 
The others are still, they are sculptures too, but they are still displays. And this one is, is really like, like a sculpture, but also kind of documentary sculpture for me, like because it kind of replicates a certain architectural element. <coughs> So later I did a, a version of it where it's even more sculpture because it's it's made from stone, it's cut from sandstone. This was an exhibition in Los Angeles at the Schindler House, which is a, a house that Rudolf Schindler, Rudolf Schindler, an Austrian architect who lived in Los Angeles, built for himself and his family. And it's they are very protective about the building, so you cannot really hang anything on the walls, you cannot out of the space in any way. So what I did was to, so that there's this chimney on one end of the room, and what I did was to replicate this chimney cover uh, from foam board again, <coughs> and to have three of these foam board exhibition walls that are very low, they're less than 150 centimeters high, and very fragile, and I used them to show three photographs that I took in Los Angeles. And somehow, I mean, here you immediately understood why it's there, but it proved to be a very interesting object because you have to bend down a little bit to watch to, to look at the photos because they are too low. They are reminding of of these tacky exhibition walls that they have in the foyers of city halls or culture houses or schools or all kinds of didactic exhibitions. When you stand in front of them, they look like they have a volume, but when you walk around, they are very, they're just from two centimeter foam board. They're also a little bit like paramounts that you can just, just hide behind, but also look So this was destroyed, but when I went back to Vienna, <coughs> I had them remade in, in acrylic glass. So here, that this, this connection to this architectural element was lost. And it was more focusing on, on what these do in space and how you walk around them. And suddenly the photos are kind of hovering in, in the air and you can see the back side of the photograph. I mean, normally you mount photograph on alu-de-bond or, or aluminium or, or wood or something. And now you, you see the, the, the mounting film and you see through the mounting film you see the back of the photo. So kind of looking at the materiality. And then again, I, I like this size very much and I was thinking about how else I could use it and I made another very big work. From Marvel. Again, they were kind of exhibition walls for a photo exhibition, but of course they were also sculptures and they were also architecture. Um, and the material I used is these two centimeter marble slabs that are the, the centimeter, two centimeters are more or less the thinnest that they can cut marble before it falls apart. But of course they want to save money and weight. So this is like the, the, the thickness that is used in architecture yeah, to, to cover facades and to cover um, bathrooms and kitchen tops and things like that. So it's in a way that the marble is used not in a sculpture but in an architectural way, it's, it's also like showing the materiality of, of what the world that surrounds us is made from. So, as I said, I, I think of it as a kind of documentary sculpture because it, both because of the things we think about when we see marble, which is about financial power and about classical beauty and, and about representing power. Uh, then also, I mean, this is stupid, but, but marble is also a kind of a photograph of geological history. It's kind of, you know, uh, it is showing what, what's happening from different 
materials and stones coming together under pressure and things like that. And it's very beautiful. And the photos that I mounted on them are architecture photographs that I always take when traveling. I, I try to see a lot of architecture when I travel and I'm especially interested in, in this kind of contemporary landmark architecture. You, know, you have this group of five to ten international architects that, that uh, do projects all over the world and, and every city that is not very important, that's not a very too important tourist destination thinks it's need, it needs an opera house by Zaha Hadid or an exhibition hall by Jean Nouvel or Couture Blau. They are about, or Frank Gehry, there are maybe five to seven architects and one woman. Uh, so like here on, on this photo we see the Ciudad de Cultura in Santiago de Compostela in Spain built by Peter Eisenman, which is a huge project, uh, much too big, they don't know how to fill it. Uh, and I go to these places and take photographs that are, to a certain extent, following the how you photograph architecture. Usually there are no people, you know, the, the verticals are vertical, but still it's not the iconic views that you know from, from books. And, and uh, this is in, in Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Arts, <coughs> where it was about the materiality of the facade. It was a lot of fun to mount the photos on, on the marble because uh, you get very interesting effects how, how the grain of, I mean here it's very obvious how the grain of the marble extends into the marble. This is the Allianz football stadium in München uh, by Herzog und Dömerung, but it's not the real thing, it's a, it's a lobby of, at the Munich airport, that's kind of a scaled down version of the Allianz Arena as, a, as an airport lobby. This is a detail of, of, a, of a fountain in Istanbul, where I like very much the notion of doing graffiti on marble. And here you see the materiality. So it's very thin. When you stand in front of it, it looks very monumental and very heavy <coughs> and very defensive too, like, like the Romans, you know, standing with their shields in front of you in an Asterix comic. But when you walk around it, you see that it's very, very thin and fragile. And what you see on the back is they kind of glue this net onto the back because it would be too fragile to be cut into two centimeter slabs. So they just glue this net onto it so when it breaks, it doesn't fall apart. Yeah. And this is the project I will show a couple. And the title of the project is Vazarelli Go Home. And it's about a kind of double incident that happened in 1969 in Budapest. When the Hungarian culture and politics were kind of isolated at that time from the international cultural scene, discovered that there are some famous Hungarians, Hungarian artists living abroad, and that they could invite them back to get some to also get some sort of international prestige by claiming these people as Hungarians, and Victor Vasarelli was one of them. And he was offered a big retrospective at the Münchalok that he also did. It was his biggest exhibition until that time with 400 works. And it was a big media spectacle. And of course at that time, abstract art in Hungary was not forbidden but tolerated, like most of you know, more, more interesting art at that, at that time. So there were also some hopes among the artists that if there was a big Vazarelli exhibition at the Mütschaunov, this would mean that there's a certain opening towards modern art in Hungary, which would also make their life easier, maybe. But at the same time, Victor Vazarelli in 1969 was certainly not avant-garde anymore was an international superstar selling his things uh, throughout the world. And also, he, I mean, he was in the tradition of Bauhaus. He was really, he really believed that art could contribute positively to, to society and to the world. So he was very keen on distributing his works on different, in different scales and on different, in different sizes from 
from doing posters and prints in very large print runs so that you know whoever you talk to in my in my generation in Europe everybody had a Vasarelli poster hanging in their kitchen when they were small. Uh, but Vasarelli was also trying to do big projects in public space. Uh, at Garmo Panas in Paris there, there are two big war pieces. There's one on the on the opera on the opera house on the theatre in Dior, for example. So, Later, after this exhibition, he also had some contacts in Hungary and did some projects. So, while, while also having certain hopes related to this exhibition, the art scene in Budapest was also very critical of this kind of uh, import of a famous artist uh, who is kind of commercialized. It's also, again, it's interesting to think about what is political art, is what he did, is it socialist art or communist art because it goes out to the masses or is it a very elaborated capitalistic distribution system that you know you have you cater to every to every need and to every person and to every uh, um, scale. So at the exhibition opening uh, the artist Janusz Moyo did a one person demonstration. He had a little sign in his pocket that he only showed that he showed to, to friends and people who knew he knew, but just just very shortly and then put it back into his pocket. Um, and the sign read Vatarei uh, Lohom, which is which I always thought was a very ambivalent statement because Vatarei was kind of coming home, but, but most of all it just meant. Go to hell, we don't need you here. Um, and I was interested in Vasarelli for a very long time because <laughs> of this, because he was so fashionable at a certain time and then became so unfashionable in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and then kind of got picked up again in the 90s. Like, I mean, all the big museums have Vasarelli pieces, but for a long time they were deep down in the storage. And only in the last 10, 15 years or so, of art is a little bit rediscovered. Vasarelli was rediscovered, except in Budapest, where there, where there's a Vasarelli museum in the page. But there's also one. There were two Vasarelli museums in, in France. One has closed. The other one is in very bad shape. So when I heard about this this Janusz Meyer action, which I think I heard it from you. A couple of years ago, I knew I, I had to investigate this further, and there's there's no documentation, there are no photographs. Um, there is one text by or two texts by Gita Pernetsky, one in the Samistat that he published by his on his own in the eighties, and the other one is, is a short paragraph in his about that text. Um, so these are photographs from the exhibition opening that I came upon after researching this event. Actually, this is a photo that is in a big Vasarelli catalog. So we can only like imagine how Mayo did his action there, but I was also very captivated to see this photo from the opening. Because they seem very interesting socially, how people meet and who they talk to and how they are dressed. I'm very interested in this couple. Who is she? Where does she come from? <laughs> who is she with? Maybe she's from Cuba. She. This is a photograph by Lamentel Boyla, who took a couple of photos at the opening. And then there's also a I will show that later. So it was very difficult to find images. At the Münchner, there were no images at all. At the MTE, the Hungarian Image or News Agency, there were only two images. Actually, this one and this. this two. And then finally, I found them at Erbola, who had maybe a dozen of photos. And I found this film that I will show you a little excerpt from which was a documentary for television.
and I proposed this and they, they accepted it very happily because um, the Spanish are quite interested in, in, in projects that deal with the relationship of culture and politics because they, they have their own history of dictatorship and how art was also used in international communications and in the, 80, in, the, in the 60s and early 70s, there was a group of Spanish artists who became very famous and that was actively um, supported by the Spanish government, people like Tapies um, and Saura and, and others. So they, they could relate to this kind of uh, model case of, of how art and politics and abstract art and modernism and Cultural, international cultural relations and the local artistic scene, how, how these things, in, the things interact. So, of course, it is very different now to show the project in Budapest, where, where people can relate to it much more directly. And this, this was also maybe something that, that relates to the project I did for the Venice Biennale for Hungary. You know, of course, Hungarians relate very differently to, to what I'm showing there. And and in this way, the work functions on many different levels. And, and Hungarians were so surprised that an inter international audience would find my work interesting because they just couldn't imagine that anybody could relate to this very specific Hungarian history. But of course, it's not so specific. It has its specifics, but it is you know, modernism was very strong uh, throughout the 20th century. And, and things like this, like culture to the masses and a certain kind of architecture and some social ideas, progressive social ideas were around in many different places. So uh, I should show some. So now I, I show an, an <coughs> excerpt from. I, the main piece of that project is a video for which I interviewed people in Budapest that were either present at the exhibition opening or for, for whom Vazreni uh, or Janos Mojo had its significance at that time. So I, I spoke with, so in the video there are eight or nine people. 
and I will show the part with Thomas Sandhuki. All in all, it's a one hour video. And since one hour is very long, we made a website where the whole video can be watched. de rengetegen voltak, mint a herringet nyüzsögtek, és egyszer csak, ahogy én is ott nyüzsögtem, megláttam Major Jánost, aki egy ilyen pici kis táblácskát tartott a kezében. Így. Közel magához. Szentációs van. Hát aztán úgy elsodrottunk egymástól. Ezt nem biztos meg én láttam a tömegben. Nagyszerű van. Nézd, hát ezzel nem lehetett nem egyet érteni, vagy egyet érteni. Hát ez egy művelet volt, a, ami hát a maj, hát major egy rendkívül szellemes ember volt. És hát szóval a... Szóval a kirobbanó röhögés volt a, a válasz. Ja. Sokszor terveztem is, még nem is olyan régen, még életében, hogy meg kéne, le, rekonstruálni kéne ezt valahogy. Hamisítani mondjuk egy félképen. Hát nézd! Opártot ö, ö, eredetiben nem láttunk addig. Az opárt az egy marhaság. Minden marhaság, de hát az, az opárt az egyik legnagyobb marhaság. De hát érdekelt az a marhaság is. Persze, hogy hogy néz az ki. Mert addig csak minél könyvbe láttunk. Tehát nagy balmót lógnak egymás mellett ezek a szentkápráztató őkörségek. Mondom, engem, engem mindig taszított ez az ez a opárt szélsőségesség. Ebben olyan kikristályosodott művészetet láttam, ami aztán nagyon jó példája volt annak, amit, amit én arra használhattam, hogy na hát én aztán művész nem vagyok, tessé. Tess nem vagyok. És volt egy plusz még, ugye ebben az egész ügyben, hogy azt mindenki tudta már jóval korábban, hogy Viktor Vazarelli a francia kommunista párt tagja, mint Picasso. En szó. És ez azért adott egy furcsa gellert az egésznek. Mert azért azt, ha így mondhatom röviden, Azért én kommunista voltam, vagyok és leszek. De az, hogy Vazereli az opárt, a francia kommunista párt opárt szekciójának a vezetője, az, szóval az nagyon groteszk volt. És kétségbe vonta az ő kommunistaságát is. Nekem az volt a benyomásom, ha jól emlékszem, hogy ez egy ilyen, ez egy ilyen ripacs ez a Vazereli. Egy szélhámos. Aki egyszerűen csak meglovagol egy, egy, egy szituációt. Ha te annyira kommunista volt, akkor, és amikor visszajött 69 vét kiáltja, nem csak mi nem maradt itt? Szóval az, hogy, hogy major oda ment és tüntetett ellen, hogy go home, hát precíz válasz volt. Én nem emlékszem arra, hogy történt volna egy ilyen analízis, hogy az opárt és a a kommunizmus hogy függ össze, hogy ők azt analizálták, hogy ez a szemkápráztatás, ez hogy függ össze a, a politikai szemkápráztatással. Major János szerintem, és objektíve bizonyítható tulajdonképpen, a világtörténelmünk egyik legnagyobb szerzője, ráadásul az egyik legnagyobb ismeretlen szerzője. Mitikus kérdésekkel foglalkozik. Azon belül 
vallásügyi kérdésekkel. Továbbá faj, rassz kérdésekkel. És mindez ö, egybe van gyúrva ö, két másik nagy mítikus témával, Erosszal, pontosabban a szexszel, még pontosabban a pornográfiával. És a másik nagy mitikus téma nála a, az ábrázolás, mint olyan, a reprezentáció, mint olyan, a képi reprezentáció, mint olyan, és ezen belül a perspektíva, mint olyan, és ezen belül a vizuális és a konceptuális egybeesések koincidenciák kérdése. Szerény, gúnyos, finom, szarkasztikus mosoly. Biztos, biztos félt egy icipicit. Meg volt rá az oka. Az egész családját már a nácik meghurcolták, nyilasok meghurcolták, aztán a komcsik meghurcolták, és aztán őt meghurcolták. De nagyon. Hát, belekeveredett a szamizdatba. Pontosabban nem keveredett bele, hanem épp, hogy belekeveredett volna. De már ez elég volt ahhoz, hogy házkutatást tartsanak nála. És a sok évtizedes üldöztetés után még ez is beüssön nála. Úgyhogy össze is roppant. És aztán sok-sok éves összeroppantsága. Úgy állt, ami főként azzal kezdődött, hogy megsemmisítette összes művét. Tehát sok-sok éves meghurcoltatása után annyira felépült, hogy elkezdte újra a képeit csinálni. Hála Istennek. Nézd, ő nem volt beteg, véleményem szerint ő nem volt beteg, a, az ország beteg. És ebben a beteg országban egy ilyenfajta ember betegnek, defin, betegként lesz definiálva. Ő nem csak egyszerűen nagyszerű művész volt, aki a koincidenciát, mint olyat ö, alkalmazza a képein, ő a koincidenciát a sorsában is konstatálta. Tehát amikor történt valami, ő tudta, hogy ez mit jelent. Vonatkozásokat látott. És mindig igaza volt. It's more than, than a local specific history because it is about 
about writing history and it's also about um, artistic scenes and groups of people and who knows what and how is information shared then and how is information shared now about these events. So this is how the video was presented in Madrid. As you heard, it's all in Hungarian, so we needed subtitles. So we made two versions, one with English subtitles and one with Spanish subtitles, which we presented on, on two uh, plasma screens back to back, dividing the room, hung from the ceiling, <coughs> so that you have this, the local audience and the international audience kind of facing each other when they watch the film. And the videos are, I mean, as you see, still camera, but with a very wide angle, so you see the person, but also a lot of the space. In every cut, instead of having a, a, a transition or a blank, you have white, so it kind of flashes a little bit when, when you have the cut, so kind of also to, to make visible the, the manipulations that I'm doing with the material, because of course I had a lot more material, everybody said, uh, I spoke with everybody for at least an hour. So of course it is put, you know, the argument is also my argument how I put it together. And then next to this space where, where the video was presented, so this is the website, because for one I, I don't expect anybody to spend one hour in an exhibition watching video, but it was also important to do something that has to do with the with the aspect of distribution that was so important to Vazarelli. So and then it obviously it seemed that the web is, I don't usually put my videos on the web, but here it seemed appropriate to, to make it accessible. So and then next to the space with the videos, there, were, there was another space again with these marble walls. Here made from the same Spanish marble like the floor in the exhibition space, so it seems like they are folded out of the floor. Uh, while it is a very beautiful material, it's not very expensive. It's the, in, a, in a place like Spain, where they have a lot of marble, it is one of the cheapest ways to cover the surface. But you, you have these things standing there, a little bit reminding of, of a crowd at an exhibition opening too. And here you, you have these archival photos from the exhibition. And I chose stills from the video that, or from the film that I just showed, the Hungarian film archive scanned from the 35 mm original. And I chose scenes where people are looking uh, critically, in a way, or, or like they're troubled or disturbed or looking back at <laughs> the So, of course, here's also a manipulation. This is the backside here. The backside of this marble looks like this. So you have, it's it's not shiny. It's it's more rough and it's uh, dirty and rusty. And sometimes you have annotations written on it with measurements. Or then there was a small intervention in the collection of Rena Sofia. There is one space with 1960s abstract geometric art where they have. The one was already that's in the museum here on the right. So here I have two of these walls in, in acrylic glass again with photos from the exhibition opening. This this couple and a young man wearing shades for the opera art exhibition. And some of the materiality and the angles corresponded very strongly with, with, with the art on the walls. Here you have you know, the angles in the Vasarelli work, you have plexiglass in this Cesar Domeno work, you have Calder's mobile that kind of is similar to the, to the sunglasses. Then there was another group of these walls on the corridor when you entered the museum. Here they were very different because they were not in an exhibition space. They looked a little bit like, like this um, utility architecture, this, the sign that shows you the way to the, to the restrooms or or a counter. And these are used for a photo series that kind of traces, so it goes away from the Vazali Moyo story a bit and kind of shows 
the traces or the legacy of modernist art and architecture in public space. So you have uh, here on the right you have a, a street scene from Budapest on Jugatite where you have these concrete uh, planters that are a bit hexagonal in their structure. This is the model of a contemporary art center in, in, in Spain that, that is a kind of contemporary version of this hexagonal structure. This is in Armenia, not hexagonal, but it's a mixture of, of modernism and, and local architectural tradition. <coughs> the title of this part was uh, La Ciudad de Color, so the, the colored city of Asina Schwarz which was uh, the title of the book by Vasarelli and his, his idea of, of how art could make the world more beautiful and livable. And then there was another part of these walls on the roof terrace of, of the museum, which is a very strange um, non-place non in a way. Kind of the far end of the museum, but you see down into the city, there's a huge roof. And what I did here was to cut out from the marble walls uh, the logos of cultural relations institutes. Uh, like here we see British Council, Goethe Institute, Instituto Cervantes. The institutions that, just like the Kulkopchula of the at that, like the Institute for Culture, International Cultural Relations, like promotes local cultures abroad and is, uh, is there for international exchange and cultural exchange. But if you were not sponsored by I, went, I was not sponsored by them. <coughs> so it was a very strange gesture to do something like this, no? to, to build monuments to these institutions uh, that all have the same goal for their respective countries. Um, often they do language courses too, and they all have these modernist logos that are based on circles and squares. Circles and squares was also the title of, of this piece, which also has a lot to do with, with Vasarelli and the, the legacy of the modernist movement, that you have this idea that these basic shapes like circles and squares and waves and things like that represent a kind of universal language of, understand, of mutual understanding through culture. And it's a silly work too. I mean, to, to, to do this kind of monuments to these institutions, but you don't have the, their names, you only have their logos. You have 10 of them standing next to each other, so you know, you're not really promoting any of them. They are kind of holes in, in the material. This is a Japan Foundation, which is a very, hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a But again, it is kind of an arrangement of four circuits, just like the British Council. I put this exactly in the spot where normally, or when I went up there, there was a guard standing on this corner. So I put it where the guard was, where the guard was standing. These are some more. This is the back here. It says. Uh, Zona B Baño, so obviously this piece of marble was supposed to be used for a, for a bathroom, but then they used it for, the piece, for this piece instead. And funnily, of course the institution photographs the piece and I got the CV with the photos and there was not one photograph showing them from the back, it was only the front, but you, I mean, you, you could walk around. This is the Danish Arts Council. Australia Council for the Arts, where the circle is an irregular circle and it's the sun. This is the Austrian Cultural Forum in Madrid that has these waves, but 
again with all the text. seriously and, and trying to understand both the, the specific history and, and also what, what this could mean because I mean on, in the core of the project there's this Swazaidi incident and then there are these two lines that, that go you know very far in a way I mean this is going very far although it is very strongly <laughs> to this idea of, of importing an international artist and also saying we have an international artist he's Hungarian um, and also, what, what you, you didn't see the photos so much of, of this middle part, but this is also going very far in a way, but it's also uh, very important to me to kind of look at when did, when, this, when did this idea start that we have to design every aspect of our living environment and that every, every detail has to be part of, of a master plan and, and the importance of architecture and design. All this is also connected to, to you know, be, being an artist and, and to see what is expected from culture in many places. You know, uh, every city wants to be a cultural city, but as a, as a cultural producer, you don't uh, you know you don't profit from that very much because what they think is culture has nothing to do with what you're doing. So. That's, that's the reason for me to be interested in these processes of how, how art is used and how architecture is used for purposes that are very, uh, very far from what, from the reasons we are doing our work. <coughs> and you have here a um, kind of a catalog which would describe um, maybe Moira's um, cultural role or whatever. Or, uh, uh, you mean about his work? Yeah. No. Uh, many people in the video talk about so there, there was a leaflet with, a, with an introductory text that I wrote and that more or less you know, contains what I told you today. Um, and then people in the in the video talk about Mayo, but Mayo remains a little bit uh, like a, like a ghost. Yeah. I mean, Tamash is one of the people describing a little bit his work. Maura Dora is doing the same. Too. So you get a, a little understanding of what his work could be about, but 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 it is not it is not about uh, it's, it's not about my work, and it's also not about the work of other so. Like you know, I mean, in, in all of my works, I, I erase things that I don't show fully or or explain fully, and where you are either triggered to to investigate further for yourself. But sometimes you can also be triggered to investigate something else. You know, something that is might be closer to you and that you are reminded of by this or some so my my works are always a kind of complex net of, of certain facts and informations and connections. But it's but it's an open field too. So ideally you can connect and you know some of the things that I put there and that also cannot be moved. I mean, I want a certain understanding of my work that is, you know, some things you cannot move, some sentences you cannot, some sentences you cannot misunderstand, <laughs> but you can still, but it's still open enough that you can bring in your own knowledge and kind of extend it into 
the direction that you feel makes sense for you. Like like these two things, like one is you know international cultural representations, and the other one is public space. But of course, there are other ways that or avenues that you could start walking on from from there on. And this is what, what the work should be. Uh, you mentioned this uh, notion by Guy Debord, Believe, in connection with this magazine. Um, would you describe your work um, in terms of the Tuma and other uh, notion by Guy Debord? I mean, a kind of critical <coughs> appropriation of science. Uh, I, I mean, appropriation, like citing science, for example, in this. Work or also uh, in the other one made for this uh, car mm -hmm. um, salon or so. uh, and a very analytical way of criticism. Um, would you agree with that? Well, yes and no, because what I'm interested in, so you know, there's this notion of the other side of a coin. And what I do is never to turn the coin around and you see what's on the bank and what's hidden, but to kind of maybe you know, stand it up and then you can decide to walk around it and choose the way, the side you, you're interested in. So all my works are, yes, they are critical, but usually they don't look critical. Or they are not even, maybe the works themselves are not even critical. They allow you to be, as a viewer, to, to to be critical. So <coughs> my work seems very neutral and distanced, which is not that you know I, I, I have a you know I have an opinion about things, but I, I think it's more interesting to, to to create situations where you are just just on the edge. You know, not not making but that's why also I, I'm I'm interested in things that that are like the marble. I mean marble is is Disturbingly beautiful, and and you are you you have to decide how you deal with this beauty. You know, are you overwhelmed by it and think that's a beautiful sculpture, which it which it isn't. Yeah, it's, it also looks very odd, and it's not a sculpture, but walls, and uh, you're, you're confronted by that. So I, I I always try to find this this kind of bridge between two slopes, mm -hmm. like like walk very precisely between between those two things. And then the more is, is, is a possibility that I try to create. That's why I try to, to, to <coughs> choose the, the objects very, very carefully. And that's why I'm super fetishistic about details because I, I try to be very, you know, always balance in the middle and, and never fall into one or either being too critical or too affirmative but always navigating to Changed so quickly. 
and and that the the, the offices and the ministries were not. Um, I mean, certainly also because of the pressure of, and because the artistic scene was looking very closely, uh, it was not possible to you know, change all the players in the ministries because they sit there for the professionals in the ministries are somewhat below politics, you know, they, they do their thing and if they are not, um, if they are lucky, the politics don't always realize that, you know, these are the persons who should be changed. Uh, and then the other thing what, what happened was that uh, it was not just the right wing who did harm to, to, to the public realm and to the cultural scene. You know, many things were already decided by the socialist conservative government before or didn't change back when, I mean now again there is a socialist conservative coalition ruling Austria. <coughs> so, I mean, it, it was finally not Haider and his Nazi party who was who had that much of an influence. I mean, neoliberalism and conservatism is something that is, um, yeah, like so much part of the political elite um, that we still have to, we should still be just as, as um, as critically what, what's happening.